Howdy folks, and welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles, a special edition this week, the Dirty Filthy Console Peasant Edition. The big news this week is that I took the plunge, mostly because of this game right here, Red Dead Redemption 2, although not just because of this game, and joined the ranks of the Dirty Filthy Console Peasants. I am now the very, very happy owner of a PlayStation 4 Pro, and... It's probably fair to say it has been occupying a significant part of my free time uh, this week since I got it. Uh, some of the games on these, I think these are now fourth generation consoles, are absolutely amazing. Don't get me wrong, I'm not abandoning the PC here or anything. If a game's available on the PC, I'm probably going to play it on the PC first because mouse and keyboard for the win. Um, but those games that are console exclusive, or PS4 exclusive, well, why restrict yourself to just one gaming platform? I realise I'm trying to justify my treachery here. <laughs> but I'm not prepared to wait six, nine, twelve months for this game, if ever, to appear on the PC. So, I bought myself a PS4 Pro. A 42 inch 4K HDR monitor. Uh, the bank balance took a serious hit. So this is basically going to be my Christmas present to myself and Rita because, well, that's the that's the good thing, first of all. The good, good things and bad things about console gaming versus PC gaming. Now that I have some experience with both. Multiplayer gaming. Obviously you can play online and that's been the PC's major selling point. Uh, since well, forever, since online gaming became a thing uh, and something that only the latest generations of consoles have been able to match but they can do that now but where the console really stands out is when you're playing together with somebody in the same room staggering back home from the pub on a Saturday night with a few bottles of beer um, collapsing on the couch, everybody grabs a controller and gets stuck into a spot of late night Multiplayer split screen, uh, sorry, split screen gaming. And yet, I've found that that doesn't really seem to be the case anymore. Now that consoles are able to enjoy online multiplayer gameplay um, just as well as a PC, the number of split screen games out there is actually surprisingly small. Never used to be the case. It used to be the major selling point of games consoles, the fact that everybody could just sit on the couch, grab a controller, and play together. Uh, there are still some out there. Gran Turismo Sport, for example. I haven't really been a fan of racing games since... Wow, this is going back. Jeff Crammon's Formula One Grand Prix by Micro Pros in 1991. I used to have that thing set up in the Chief Stoker's office on HMS Coventry and myself and other members of the Chiefs Mess um, would pop in on an evening and try to beat each other's lap times. We'd have post-it notes set up above the monitor um, posting the latest lap times for the next person to come in and try to beat. It was a fantastic game, but I haven't really been in a racing game since then. Um, and the reason I got Gran Turismo Sport was because it's one of the games out there that does actually offer split-screen competitive gaming. So myself and Rita can each grab a controller, plonk our asses down on the beanbag and spend a couple of hours trying to beat each other around Brands Hatch or Silverstone. Um, I took a bit of a risk getting this game because, like I said, I haven't really played a racing game since 1991. Just to put that into perspective for you, that's actually the year Rita was born. <laughs> so yeah, anyway. Um, but this is an absolutely astonishingly good game. Um, obviously I'm playing it on, I'm a complete noob, I've never used a controller before, <laughs> I'm very very new to racing games difficulty settings, but it's a lot of fun, a lot more than I was expecting. And it doesn't hurt that it looks absolutely incredible too. And it's a PlayStation exclusive. See, a lot of people said, Jingles, why didn't you get an Xbox One or whatever the latest version of the Xbox is? And I did consider it, because apparently it's technically a more powerful console. But there's not a huge number of Xbox exclusives, because Microsoft eventually 
anything that appears on the Xbox is probably going to appear on the PC. And I've got a PC, so at some point I'm going to be able to play almost everything that appears on the Xbox. You can't say that about the PlayStation. There are still a lot of games out there that are PlayStation exclusives, and, well, this is one of them. So that's the reason why I picked a PS4 Pro as opposed to an Xbox. Of course, it didn't matter which console I picked, I was going to have to get used to playing on a gamepad, and that has been a major stumbling block, because, you know, mouse and keyboard for the win. Controlling anything is just so easy on a PC, first-person shooters in particular. I've never understood why console gamers have said they just couldn't get into playing, I don't know, Call of Duty, for example, on a PC. They found it too difficult to control. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Are you serious? It, it, is, it is intrinsically more difficult to control a character in a first-person shooter on a gamepad than it is with a mouse and keyboard. How can you say that, Jingles? Well, you have to have aim assist on a gamepad in order to snap to a target uh, to be able to play effectively. There's none of that on the PC, is there? Why is that? Because you don't need it on the PC. <laughs> so, but anyway, you know, uh, people like what they like and they're used to what they're used to. I can certainly attest to the fact that it's been one hell of a learning curve getting used to how to control anything effectively with a joypad, but it didn't take that long. I mean, it was incredibly frustrating at first, particularly when I was playing Red Dead Redemption 2, uh, until it was actually Rita who discovered that you tap the... Oh, there's so many different buttons on the gamepads these days, but you tap, you basically have to ensure that you're pointing roughly at the target. Apparently this isn't new to Red Dead Redemption 2, this is how shooters work on consoles. You make sure that if you're pointing roughly towards the target you wish to shoot, you tap the uh, left trigger button to lock onto the target and hold it, and then the right trigger button to actually shoot. So that, it took some getting used to, but I'm reasonably competent at it now. Not competent enough to be able to effectively play something like God of War, which is another amazing game, but, well, kind of hard. <laughs> I think I'd like to get slightly more competent with the use of a gamepad before I have another go at playing that, but there are... Well, I'm getting better at it, and, you know, practice makes perfect. One of the things, one of the misconceptions that I had when I first started uh, playing games on the PlayStation was that, well, if you jump on a PC and you've played a first-person shooter, as long as you've played any other first-person shooter on the PC, you know how to play any other first-person shooter. W, A, S, D, and mouse. Now that's pretty much it. Yeah, individual titles have certain other keys that you have to press, but as long as you know W, A, S, D, and mouse, you can pick everything else up as you go along. Now, I was under the impression, although it was mostly just down to my inexperience, that that was not the case on a console when you're using a gamepad. It seemed at first that every game had its own custom control setup. Uh, it was almost as if you had to learn how to play on a console every time you popped a new game into the disk drive. Um, that's not actually the case. It just seemed like that to me at first, mostly down to my own inexperience. Um, console shooters all tend to have roughly the same control setup. Um, driving games seem to have roughly the same control setup. It's mostly down to, well, you tend to, for example, uh, control your aim with one thumb stick, I suppose you'd call them, and your movement with the other. So in that respect, it's not entirely dissimilar from controlling a tank in World of Tanks, and well, we all know how to do that. Although having said that, when I did play World of Tanks on the console, um, it was tricky. <laughs> but again, uh, that may just have been because that was my that was like World of Tanks Mercenaries, the PlayStation Pro version of World of Tanks, is actually the first console game I have ever played. And so it was the first time I'd ever try to, try to use a joypad to control anything. I'd probably be a little bit better at it now that I've had about a week or so to get used to it, but it was kind of tricky at first. Oh, incidentally, well, I didn't, I didn't know this. World of Tanks on the PlayStation, probably also on the Xbox One. The console version of World of Tanks has a single-player story campaign. <laughs> I had no idea. Um, yeah. Uh, there's quite an extensive campaign you can play through, single player, you against bots. Why did nobody tell me this? 
and it's not bad. It's a tie-in apparently, it's called World of Tanks War Stories on the consoles. And apparently it's a tie-in with a series of comics um, written by Garth Ennis and illustrated, well at least in the uh, first series, illustrated by the legendary Spanish comics artist, sadly now deceased, he died this year, Carlos Esquerra, who together with John Wagner created Judge Dredd. Um, I've actually read the comics. They are very good, by the way. I do recommend them, as you'd expect anything written by Garth Ennis to be. I've been reading them on the X-Comics app on my uh, Kindle Fire. But yeah, the comics are very, very good. Um, anyway, yes, getting kind of off topic here. Talking about comics jingles. Focus on the gaming. Yes, yeah, what, were, what were we talking about anyway? I've completely lost the plot at this point. I'm just staring at the replay here of my ninth place finish on the Northern Isle Speedway. Holy shit, man, would you look at these graphics? Of course, that's the other thing. And again, what has always been one of the major selling points of consoles. It didn't really matter what game you wanted to play on a console, you knew it was going to work. See, that's always been the downside of PC gaming. I mean, sure, those of us with expensive high-end PCs, with the latest, or at least one generation old graphics card, the very best gaming experiences with vastly superior frame rates and screen resolutions to anything that the consoles had been able to offer. Until now, this is being played in 4K, something that I can't actually do on my PC, although that's, well I probably could, but that's more down to the limitation of the 24 inch monitor that I have on my PC. My graphics card could probably manage it. If I was to connect the 42 inch 4K monitor that I have on the PlayStation Pro to my PC, my graphics card could probably render, oh I don't know, let's pick a game, um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey in 4K at 60 frames per second. It might struggle a bit. There may be the occasional bit of screen tearing when the camera's moving quickly. Hell, there is even an occasional bit of screen tearing right now with my current 1080 GTX graphics card running at 1920x1080, not 4K, at 60 frames per second. When it's rendering a particularly pretty visual, I do get a little bit of screen tearing right now, even on a PC with a GTX 1080 graphics card. You don't get none of that on the PS4. This particular race replay I know for a fact would bring my PC to its knees, and yet the PS4 Pro renders it without breaking a sweat. And remember, I have a relatively powerful PC, it's not cutting edge anymore, but it was bloody expensive when I got it. Not everybody enjoys playing games on such a powerful PC. What about people with mid-range, or heaven forbid, potato-powered low-end PCs? They can only look at visuals like this. <laughs> <laughs> which is practically photorealistic and just bury their head in their hands and shed salty tears at the price of being a proud card-carrying member of the PC gaming master race. It's not all about fancy visuals, Jingles. No, you're absolutely right, it isn't. Although fancy visuals do kind of help. Um, for me, at least, if you give me fancy visuals, an engaging story, and clever game mechanics. In fact, you don't even have to give me all three. If you can just give me any two of those three, and I'm probably going to enjoy your game. Oh, hello Detroit Become Human. Fancy seeing you here. Um, I bought, as you can tell, a whole bunch of new games for the PS4. Um, most of which I haven't actually bothered, mostly because of Red Dead Redemption 2, by the way, uh, which has been eating up huge chunks of my life. But most of these games I had not actually played until today when I came to do this episode of Mingles with Jingles, and I thought, Christ, Jingles, you've got all these new PS4 games. At least get some game footage of some of them for Mingles with Jingles. Um, limited, though, my experience of this game has been, because I've only played half an hour of it. It is, at least at first, very, very impressive. Fancy graphics, don't really yet know about the engaging storyline, but it does have some very clever game mechanics. Let's take a quick look. We're going to investigate this crime scene to try to gather any information that's going to help us in defusing a hostage situation that's happening on the balcony outside. So this was the Detroit Police Department first responder, patrol officer Anthony Deckhart, who was the first one to, well, you know, respond, and got shot by the household android responsible for this 
hostage situation. It's gone rogue. It's already killed the father and it's holding the little girl hostage. So we've been able to tell from the gunpowder residue on his hands that he managed to fire at least one shot. Now we're attempting to reconstruct exactly what happened. And there's a clue over there. Hostage witnessed the shooting. Okay. And Officer Deckhart, it appears, was able to get at least one shot off and managed to injure the suspect. So we've got the clever game mechanics box ticked. But it goes, well, several steps further than that. Once you've actually resolved the scene, and I'm not going to show you the full resolution because spoilers, but once you have resolved the scene, you get this. They call this the flowchart. It shows you all the various different possibilities that you explored, all the evidence that you gained, the interactions that you made, but it also shows you the stuff that you missed. Well, it doesn't actually show you exactly what it was that you missed, but it shows you that you did miss stuff. I mean, apparently I only completed 35% of this particular scene, even though I did save the hostage. But the possible outcomes... My outcome was only one of six possible conclusions that this particular scene could have had. So I'm thinking replayability factor, absolutely huge here. Now, is this a review of Detroit Become Human? No, of course not. I've only played 15, 20 minutes of the game. But it's definitely got the clever game mechanics box ticked. So I'm going to be exploring this one in greater detail at some point in the future. Another PS4 exclusive that I've been getting very, very excited about is Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, the promise of... I mean, I, I really do like these big open-world games. Games like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Ghost Recon Wildlands, um, Red Dead Redemption 2. And again, it's a PlayStation exclusive. Let's just watch a little bit, shall we? To us, we're left the splendors of creation. Beasts of air, water, earth, and steel. One thing to hunt a beast, another to hunt a machine. You must be humble and respect their power. I will teach you this one day. This apparently is the third best selling PlayStation 4 game with 7.6 million copies sold. And yes, I know sales are no indication of quality. Just look at well, just about anything that Electronic Arts has ever published. But I'm willing to give this one a go. It certainly looks impressive. It seems to have a compelling and engaging story. The basic idea here is it's set thousands of years after some kind of global apocalypse, which has wiped out our civilization, um, while leaving only the relics, hence the big machines wandering around everywhere. It's an open-world, third-person, action, role-playing adventure game. It seems like they're trying to tick as many different boxes as possible. Um, which, you know, being ambitious is no bad thing. And this game was apparently one hell of a risk for the developers, who hadn't actually published anything since 2004, a game called Killzone that I've never heard of. The development of this thing started in 2011. And it would have killed the studio if it hadn't been a success. But third most popular PlayStation 4 game ever with 7.6 million copies sold. Uh, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to having a go with this because it seems to tick all of the boxes that I like as well. Now, two of my major concerns when it came to getting a games console were being able to stream and being able to record gameplay footage. Well, we did do... I can't remember exactly when it was. Last week? Wednesday? Thursday? Something like that. Uh, Rita decided that she wanted to stream Red Dead Redemption 2 to Twitch. So I thought, okay, challenge accepted. She was actually streaming World of Warships uh, from her PC in the other room. And I said, I'll go and see about setting it all up. If you want to stream to the PlayStation Network, not to Twitch or any other external service, but if you want to just stream to the PlayStation Network, the joypad actually has a share button. You just press that and you're streaming to the PlayStation Network, whatever it is that you're playing. It is that simple. Streaming to something like Twitch, 
or YouTube takes slightly longer. But it only takes slightly longer because you have to download either the Twitch or and the YouTube app and then connect your PlayStation account to those. And then all you have to do <laughs> is press the share button on the joypad and you're streaming. It is that simple. A lot of people use game capture cards. Um, apparently the game capture card of choice that most people seem to use is the Elgato HD60S, but you absolutely don't need it. Well, you certainly don't need it on a PlayStation 4 Pro. It might be useful on a regular PlayStation 4, I don't know. But on a PlayStation 4 Pro, native streaming from the console of whatever the hell you're playing couldn't be any simpler or smoother. Streaming from a PC, you do need a multiple monitor setup. One monitor for the gameplay and another monitor so you can keep an eye on Twitch or YouTube or whatever and respond to what's going on in chat. Um, again, none of that on the PlayStation 4. It actually arranges the webcam and sticks it off to the side of the screen above the chat box. So while you're watching your gameplay at the side of the screen, you've got the webcam output and then underneath that you've got chat, so you don't need multiple monitors and everybody watching doesn't have the webcam getting in the way of the gameplay either. It's absolute genius. So that's the streaming box tick, but what about recording gameplay? Well, as you can see, haven't had a problem recording gameplay either. Well, I did it first. It was kind of tricky. You need an external USB storage device, so an external hard drive. It must be USB 3 and it must have at least 250 gigabytes on it, but if you can tick those two boxes, and let's face it, that's not expensive, then you just plug it into the USB 3 port, set it as a storage device, and while you're playing anything, hit the share button, and it will start recording anything up to an hour of gameplay footage, or until you hit the share button again to stop recording. It's as simple as that, just start and stop by hitting that share button on the gamepad. So, no game capture card required for recording gameplay footage either. All I have to do is every now and then uh, just transfer all of the video that I've saved from the capture library to the external hard drive, then unplug it, stick it into the PC, and away you go. Couldn't be easier. My one complaint would be that it's not always obvious when you're recording. It's not like on the PC, for example, where if I'm using Bandicam or NVIDIA Shadowplay, there's an on-screen indicator that doesn't actually get recorded into the video, but it's there on screen while you're playing and recording to let you know that you are actually recording. You don't get that on the PlayStation. Now, there's been more than a couple of times where I've thought to myself, am I actually recording this? <laughs> and, uh, and the only real way to confirm whether I was or wasn't recording uh, was to wait until there was a suitable break in the action, hit the share button to see whether or not the you have now saved a clip or the you are now recording button popped up. Um, so minor complaint um, and one that I'm more than willing to put up with. So yeah, I've been pretty happy so far with my experience on the PlayStation 4. The only games that I've gotten for it, by the way, are all the PlayStation exclusives. Um, Gran Turismo Sports, Red Dead Redemption 2, Horizon Zero Dawn here, Uncharted 4, God of War, Marvel's Spider-Man, uh, and Until Dawn. Oh wait, nearly forgot, I also got The Last of Us, the remastered version, because it's a game I've always wanted to play, and it's never coming out on the PC. Don't know why. I think it would work very well as a PC game, but, eh, whatever. Reasons. Um, pretty much all of the console or PlayStation 4 exclusives. There is one other game I've got that I was very much looking forward to and which turned out to be one hell of a disappointment because the game itself is utter dog shit. I even had to import it because it's not available in Europe. I am of course talking about Girls and Panzer Dream Tank Match. <laughs> I thought there was no way I wasn't going to like this game, because I, I love Girls and Panzer. Oh wow, this game is terrible. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so bad. And it could have been good. It features... I can't even show you how bad it was, right? Because it wouldn't even support video capture. For some reason, they've decided that every single element of gameplay in Girls and Panzer Dream Tank Match is a blocked scene, which you cannot record. 
Well, you can't record it natively. Maybe you can record it with an external capture card, but yeah, whatever. Um, why is it so bad, Jingles? Oh, allow me to explain. So, basically, what you have is a whole bunch of tank battles that you can play. And any of you who've actually watched Girls and Panzer, you can reenact the battles from the TV show. That's not all you can do, but here's the thing. The battles themselves, while they are quite pretty, they used sort of 3D rotoscoped tanks and the characters from the anime show. The battles only last two or three minutes at the most, and the game mechanics are kind of simple. A lot more simple than World of Tanks, for example. But, and this is the major kicker, because the battles only last a couple of minutes, what do you have between the battles to link the narrative? Ah, well, do you know what a visual novel is? For those of you who do, yeah. For those of you who don't, there's a peculiar breed of... I hesitate to use the word game. Uh, but basically, what you have is a bunch of anime girls, usually very badly animated, <laughs> if animated at all. Uh, yapping away at you in front of a pre-rendered background while you skip pages and pages and pages of text. So, in a nutshell, Girls and Panzer Dream Tank Match is a couple of minutes, if you're lucky, of admittedly quite pretty but kind of basically simple tank battle gameplay interspersed between anything up to 20 minutes of text as these Anime girls just stand there jabbering about their favourite tea and cakes. <laughs> I'm not joking, okay? <laughs> and when I say anything up to 20 minutes, I'm guessing it might be longer. At one point, I, I just finished another incredibly short tank battle. And the girls started spouting walls of text at me. Now you can skip the text on screen by pressing the um, X key on the joypad. Which I naturally did as quickly as I could. After five minutes of skipping the text with still no end in sight, I just ejected the disc. Life is too short to put up with that kind of shit. So it turns out that the PC isn't alone in having shit games. There are plenty of them out there on the PlayStation 2. There of course are games that appear on both platforms. Fallout 4 being a notable example, as is Skyrim. Now I don't have Skyrim on the PlayStation, but I did have a go of Fallout 4 on the PlayStation, and it is pretty good. But it's way better on the PC. Yeah, it's just so much easier to control what you're doing with a mouse and keyboard. I mean it works on the on the PS4. And I dare say that if you've never played on a PC and you're a committed console gamer and you just using a joypad is second nature to you, it's probably very playable on the PlayStation or the Xbox, you know, whatever floats your boat. But trust me, it's better on the PC. It just is. Of course, the good thing is now I don't have to choose. I've got all of the PlayStation and console exclusives available to me, and if it's available on the PC, I can and probably will play it on the PC, because at the end of the day, mouse and keyboard is for winners. So, while on the one hand I have no doubt that many of you are crying salty tears of despair that I have gone over to the dark side and have become a filthy console peasant and am no longer exclusively a member of the PC gaming master race, I am now in fact just a gamer. And you know what? I think I prefer it that way. I'm not saying that it's hard to go back to sitting in front of a desk with a mouse and keyboard once you've experienced the joys of just kind of spreading yourself all over a couch-sized beanbag with a cool drink next to you uh, in front of a 42-inch 4K HDR monitor. Um, but I like having the option of both. Anyway, that's it for this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. I hope you've enjoyed it, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.